all you big fans of good television, actual democracy, lively discussion. Thanks for carving out an hour or so in your day today. We are honored. Uh, I'm Don Foster. I'm the chair of the Field Team 6 Advisory Board. And uh, I just want to take a minute before the big fun begins to make sure that everybody's got a, a beverage, a lovely beverage of their choice. Remind you to put your uh, Zoom screen in full screen mode when you get a chance. Uh, at the bottom of that screen, there's a chat button. So click on that button to open the chat window. And uh, that's where we'll be posting links and such throughout the panel. So get on that. Uh, you can also use the reactions icon down there to clap or give a thumbs up. Uh, but feel free to do that in real life too, if you're so inclined, that's a cool thing. Uh, all of you who ponied up some real dough, uh, some real significant coin uh, today. Thank you so much. Uh, the spin room will open automatically. Uh, so if uh, right after the event, so if you can use your real name uh, on your screen so we can locate you digitally and invite you digitally into the, uh, uh, the digital chat room, that would be very cool. So I'm just looking, I'm looking at you, Carlos Danger, real names, real names only. And, uh, uh, just wanted to remind everybody that this is a fundraiser. So uh, you might want to count on having a second beverage at hand and maybe a, a coaster uh, of your choice. We have so far raised over $21,000 and our Goal is a mere 25,000. So grab a beverage. We're gonna begin by introducing our lovely monitor, Mr. Patrick M. Verone. Uh, you might know him. <laughs> he, he's, he sent me his list of credits and they're scattered somewhere on my screen. So Patrick, join, join in. I know you from The Simpsons. I know you from Futurama. I know you have an animated uh, feature right now. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind jumping in and letting us know what that's, that's about and then introducing the panel. Uh, thank I've got, you, Don. I've got a beverage to drink. Yes. Thank you, Don. Always wanted to say that. Makes me feel like a game show host. Thank you, Don. Um, ignoring my credits, I don't actually have an animated feature in the works. Um, I have an animated television show on Netflix called Disenchantment. Um, uh, uh, I'm coming to you live tonight from the map room in my home where my Zoom studio is, also known as the hallway outside of my bedroom. I'll be moderating tonight's discussion uh, in which we'll be asking four distinguished television professionals the important question, has America jumped the shark or will Zoom meetings be eligible for the Emmys next year? Let me introduce our panel of panelists. Alphabetically, first by last name is any winning writer, actor, and comedian who can be seen currently on HBO's A Black Lady Sketch Show. She was previously a writer and correspondent on Full Frontal with Samantha B and is currently writing on Apple TV's Ted Lasso. From somewhere in Los Angeles, please welcome Ashley Nicole Brown. I will be making the applause sound that I know you're making at home. Alphabetically first, by last name, is the executive producer of The Simpsons where he has been a writer for 31 years and showrunner for 20 a record in television history that will never, ever be, be surpassed yeah. because he will never, ever leave that show. Here from somewhere else in Los Angeles, Al Jean. Our next, uh, more applause, yes, yes, applause. Um, I called her Ashley Nicole Brown and Ashley Nicole Black. I beg your pardon. Okay, so there's the first thing that we'll have to cut out. Our next panelist is currently best known as the showrunner, executive producer, and director of Veep, 
but he is previously best known for his work on Curb Your Enthusiasm, Seinfeld, Saturday Night Live, as well as the feature films Eurotrip, The Dictator, and if you press him on it, The Cat in the Hat. From yet another place in Los Angeles, David Mandel. Hi, everyone. Right. And our next panelist is author, director, and creator of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, whose writing credits are so extensive, I can only include the monosyllabic ones, Charmed, Coach, Monk, Sibs, Nickus. No, that's NCIS. She has also written jokes for such luminaries as Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, David Letterman, and the most powerful person in there in the, on earth, Miss Piggy. Coming to us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, around the corner from Elizabeth Warren's house, it's Nell Scovell. So that's Hi. all the time we have. Uh, now that you've been teased by the panel, I'm going to remind you all of why we're here, to promote and advance the work of Field Team Six. And here to tell you about that work is the founder of Field Team Six, who didn't send me a bio, Jason Berlin. <laughs> Oh my God, uh, uh, I'm so honored that you're all here. Uh, it's, it's insane. Um, so yes, I'm Jason Berlin. Um, I was a, a TV writer for 18 years. I was just like you, except uh, just much less talented. And uh, then Trump was elected and it uh, broke my mind and heart and I needed to quit my job and throw myself into volunteering. So over the, the next two years and the lead up to the midterms, with the volunteer army, we were able to rally who consisted of 70 to 100% women, depending on the day. We were able to register over 6,000 progressive voters across the five swing districts of Southern California and help do our part to, to flip all five districts, including all of Orange County and help flip the house. Um, after the midterms, my job with the party ended, which is normal and also completely nuts. And that's why I founded Field Team Six, so that we could go big and uh, go national and see what kind of good trouble we could get into on, you know, in, in what's now the biggest fight of our lives. So since then, we've registered almost 22,000 progressive voters across our 12 battleground states, states targeted to help us expand our House majority, flip the Senate, and take back the White House. Um, our stated mission is register Democrats, save the world. And by that, we mean the, our volunteers are part of that for sure, but the people really saving the world are the voters we register, who are about 75% uh, people of color, young people and women. And uh, we're super proud of that. Since COVID, we've pivoted to an all digital organization and we're reaching out through text, email, phone calls, social media ads to two huge lists we've found uh, all together, that's 8.7 million uh, purged voters and public college kids. Um, you know, people of color are uh, uh, inordinately targeted, uh, you know, in these lists. So we're doing our best to get everyone registered as Democrats to vote from home. And, you know, even better, drop the ballots off at a, a, a ballot drop box. Um, so that is, that is our... Uh, our mission. Oh, wait, whoa, what is this? What? Oh, I'm getting a transmission. Oh, really? Oh my God. Our field team six spies outside of Moscow are picking something up. What are you worried about? What is that? Registration portal hmm. is only for Democrats. Is trending on Twitter. Huh. All right. How about this? How about you pull U.S. out of NATO, and we'll see about this voterizer. <laughs> yes, deal. You lose election, you come live here, like Snowden. We love Americans. You are a very tough negotiator, Mr. President, and very good looking. <laughs> so that that uh, 
introduces that brings me to our, uh, 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 our latest invention. It's our very own voter registration app, Voterizer. We just launched it last weekend. Uh, we got over, over 24 million impressions. Um, and it is like us. Uh, the, one of the reasons we are unique among voter registration organizations is we are proudly, respectfully partisan. And uh, that, that means we can do voter registration unshackled. And we did this in real life. Now we do it on our app and digitally. The first page of our voter registration app says, save the world from Trump, register to vote. And what happens when you do that is about zero Republicans get registered on your app. So <laughs> that is that's part of what makes us so effective. Um, and, uh, and, and all our outreach is, is similarly uh, partisan and and just would, helps us do the most good in the places we're in. So thank you all so much for being here and helping us save the world by being here. Um, I'm going to turn it back to the Honorable Patrick Verone now. Um, not as honorable as I was at the beginning of the uh, of the program. Uh, the Oxford English Wiktionary defines jumping the shark as an idiom used to describe a moment when something that was once widely popular, but has since grown less popular, makes a misguided attempt at generating publicity that instead only serves to highlight its irreverence. That's kind of a convoluted description of it. I think of it as the turning point when something that was once great now stinks. It is based on an episode of the television series Happy Days from 1977, which Fonzie, my dog is barking, because it's a Zoom call. Fonzie was challenged to water ski in his black leather jacket over a shark tank. More on that later. I want to begin this discussion since our panelists, is now minute 14 and our panelists haven't said a word. I want to begin with the question that we've all been asking. Has America jumped the shark? I'm assuming the answer is yes, otherwise we have no need to be here. So for the, the question for the, for the panelists is, when for you did America jump the shark? Can we start with Nell? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm going to define jumping the shark it's weird. Okay, I'm going to define jumping the shark to mean a specific absurd act that when we look back, we can pinpoint it to the beginning of a downfall. So let me take you back to October 20th, 2016. Hillary Clinton has just given a speech at the Al Smith dinner. She's hilarious. Trump gets booed. The next day, her poll numbers soar. She's winning by double digits with about three weeks to go. Exactly one week later, FBI director and human hat rack James Comey announces that the FBI is reviewing emails by Clinton that were found on the Try to help you switch that on. Or, by the way, why don't you go ahead? I have an idea. A Puma Avedine and is being investigated for sexting a teenager. So it was unprecedented that an FBI director would say a candidate was under investigation. Comey did it anyway, and while Clinton was cleared of all suspicions, the Comey letter led to yeah, a... But then you're, but then you're to be and that's when you know that the shark. So the parallels to the Happy Day episode would be as follows. Huma Abedin is Potsy. Anthony Weiner is Ralph Mouth, who sets the whole absurdity into motion. Uh, the shark is the Comey letter, this absurd potential danger. James Comey is Richie at the wheel of the speedboat dragging Fonzie, who is Donald Trump. Uh, Fonzie even flashes their signature, shared thumbs up as he approaches. Um, although unlike Fonzie, Donald Trump has never been cool. Um, and uh, Fonzie triumphs and is hailed a hero. Um, and Hillary Clinton. Who is Hillary Clinton in this scenario? Anyone want to unmute themselves and guess? Just jump in. No? All right. Hillary is the viewer. She is all of us watching in horror and thinking, are you fucking kidding me? 
So that's, that's when America jumped the shark for me. Thank you, Nell. Uh, I would like to now turn to whatever Ashley Nicole we have here. I assume it's Ashley Nicole Black. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my moment for me when America jumped the shark is actually much more subtle. It's so subtle, I can't even tell you exactly when and where it happened, but I think Van Jones did it. I'm not sure. But for me, America jumped the shark the moment the first person said Donald Trump has a new tone. That was the moment where we stopped being like normal, smart people who like know, hey, if the stove is hot, don't put your hand on the stove. And we became people who have to live in a world where once every three weeks, we all go, let's try touching the stove and see what happens. <laughs> Maybe the stove has a new tone. So for me, America ended the moment we started pretending that there was ever going to be a new tone. And I'm not even sure what day it was. I wasn't paying close enough attention. Thank you, Ashley. Another acceptable answer would have been uh, America jumped the shark in 1619. Uh, Al, why don't you give it a shot? I was just going to say 1619. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a backup answer. <laughs> First of all, I would like to say I'd like to defend the uh, jumping the shark episode of Happy Days. I think it actually is kind of funny. I think that Happy Days was a great show and it ran for many years afterwards. So I think that to use it as this... Um, stand in for all the you know worst episodes of the worst television shows of all time is pretty unfair uh but that being said i would um hesitate to to, to say america has not yet jumped the shark because this title of this uh, panel is a question not a, not a period and um uh, and that isn't to say this is a really bad time i mean it is obviously this week is a really bad time everything that's happening now uh, is pretty scary to me you know but I also think if you look back at other times, you know, in 1941, we were fighting two highly scientific, very deadly war machines, uh, you know, one of which was working towards a nuclear bomb. If you look at the Civil War, I, I think people then might consider that that was about as bad a time as now or worse. Um, plagues end and they often end in a couple of years. I mean, not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying that it's not something to be ignored. Uh, and I think that the biggest thing that we can do, which is why I'm here, is uh, make sure that Joe Biden and um, Kamala Harris win this election, because I think that is the biggest turning point we can affect with our own behavior. Thank you, Al. Dave, can I step on your joke, or do you have something that I haven't thought of? Oh. Am I unmuted now? I apologize. Uh, well, obviously, 1618 is the correct answer. Um, and I was going to say that during the Civil War, at the height of the Confederacy, at no point did um, Jefferson Davis ever say, I'm going to put my son-in-law, Jared, in charge of anything. Um, but uh, uh, so I guess I was going to truly say the real problem, if jumping the shark is a real thing, which I sort of agree with Al, I'm not sure it really is. Um, I'm not sure there is any really great moment here um, other than the moment that sort of Republicans decided to make him their nominee, or I guess the moment that he sort of won the election, um, because it's just been this death by a thousand cuts. That, that's, that's the real problem here um, is, you know, I, we, I'd love to say that's the moment and that the problem is there is no real wonderful moment here. It's just been this just gradual wearing down of just all of us, it just, it doesn't stop on any given day. It just doesn't stop, um, which is very different than the jumping the shark, which seems to be one moment. Um, anyway, I hope this is working. I'm having a lot of internet issues. And if you see me ducking out, I'm ducking out just really quickly, just because the pool boy is fucking my wife. And I just have to check back in on that every now and then. But so I do apologize if you're, there are issues. Anyway, continue. They were assuming for all of us that whatever internet service provider we have uh, is, uh, is throttling our internet service because clearly that's the next stage in the, in the corporate takeover of communication. Um, I want to call everyone's attention, of course, to the Field Team 6 website, but when you're not paying attention to that website, there's another website which has the, the delightful title, whatthefuckjusthappentoday.com which uh, has 1,317 entries in it, 
one for each day of the Trump administration. And each day has an entry for what the F just happened today, which range from, you know, the Putin promance, Kim Jong-un love letters, murder hornets, building the, whole, the building wall, kids in cages, porn star payoffs, paper towel gate, Sharpie gate, Kofifi gate, abandoning the Kurds, shithole countries, war on science, war on immigrants, war on the postal service, war on TikTok, war on low water pressure. It goes on and on and on. Uh, and in fact, I'm just checking with the Guardian to see how we jumped the shark today. And uh, of course, we're moments away from the great shark jumper himself giving his, uh, his uh, acceptance speech or his fifth acceptance speech this week at which uh, we will inevitably have uh, an additional number of, of shark jumping suggestions. Um, let me move on to uh, a question that, that's more of a craft question for uh, all of us here who are in fact writers and many of our our uh, many of our audience members are, are as well. The question is this, what is it like to write comedy during a national tragedy? And, and I want to start with with Al because as we all know, The Simpsons actually predicted Trump, right? Uh, there was an episode where he was president, but I hesitate to add, the next president is Lisa Simpson, so there's hope. <laughs> and now, do you do you do you find that 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 writing during this bit? So you've been on that show for thirty years across well, five presidencies. Has writing the show changed because of Trump? Well, um, I have a, a sort of a larger view about how comedy operates in the, in the age of Trump. I remember when we started, there was this thing called trying to be objective or, or a little bit unbiased. And, um, you know, we completely threw that out in 2016. We completely took a position against Trump. We did several internet spots that were anti-Trump. You know, you saw pretty much every talk show host just throw themselves against Trump. And it just didn't work. And um, I've, I've thought about that a lot. And I wondered why um, people who had, you know, sort of a unanimity of the entertainment voices that they listened to say, don't vote for this guy, still elected this guy with a minority vote to the presidency. And um, I, I guess what I have to say is uh, there's just a limit to what comedy can do. I think that you, um, you try to satirize something, you try to make fun of something, but um, you, you kind of wind up having to, you know, people talk about Trump fatigue and, and uh, you know, it's a real thing in terms of like life, but I also think it's true in terms of comedy. You, you have to kind of think of a fresh way to approach people or, or they're just going to tune out. Dave, so you have a similar experience. Dave, are you back? Are you still? Uh, um, there you we're are. We're good. Okay. We're good. Uh, so have you, you, did you have, was there any change in the way Veep was written because of not even so much who the Veep was because she was president by that point, but was there any change in terms of what you could or couldn't do because Trump had actually already done it? I mean, yes and no. When he was first elected, um, we got lucky in that Selena was technically within the show out of office. It was a show about a former president of the United States. And we got very lucky in that we weren't using the sort of uh, the props of the office the way he's been illegally using them all throughout this convention. We weren't doing scenes in the Oval. We weren't doing a White House press secretary, you know, giving briefings. So the show looked and felt different. She was trying to do these other things. She was trying to do, uh, you know, build a library and all of these things. And then when she ran for the office, we were doing a show about um, a, an election. Um, which started to get very close. And what really happened was, I guess the honest answer is, we got off the air just in time. Because what, what happened was, we had a, a room of really smart, funny comedy writers thinking to themselves, what's the stupidest thing an elected official or somebody who wants to be an elected official could say or do or, or propose? And as we were airing the final season, we would air on a, like on a Sunday night, 
And by Tuesday, Trump was sort of saying some of the things that we had sat down and come up with as the stupidest things someone had come up with. So he was, he was sort of outdoing a really good room of comedy writers. And so, like I said, we kind of got off the air just in time. We literally, by our second to last episode, had a moment where um, Jonah, who was running, he was a congressman running for the presidency, um, was holding his own version of a rally where he brought up immigrants and somebody in the crowd yelled, um, kill them. And he sort of said, no, they're not all bad. And then the following Tuesday, Trump did a rally in Florida and said something about immigrants and someone in his crowd yelled, shoot them. And he laughed. And at that point, I was done. It was sort of like, luckily we were, we everything was sort of finished and edited because had it not been, I'd have pulled the show from the air at that point. We were, it just, it just, it, 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 it leapfrogged us in ways that were just horrific. And he is, I guess, much like, you know, scientific fact or like uh, actual, you know, honest reporting, they have no room in their world for like, you, you know, you're not, you can't make fun of that. Or how dare you make fun of that? But also a, a lack of realization that they themselves, what they're saying is, I mean, last night on, uh, what was it Pence? Make America great again, again? Come on, man. I mean, I just, it, at some point, it's just like, I, fu I fucking give up. I it just, it's just pointless. Um, so yeah, sorry. Very depressed. Please, please don't. Don't give up, Dave. We're, we're all here for you, and, and we appreciate what you do. Um, we also appreciate, uh, Nell, the question for you, since you've written for actual people uh, like Barack Obama and, and Hillary Clinton, uh, Letterman, uh, others not so real like Miss Piggy, does that, it, how, I assume you have not written for Trump, and I wonder if you even know anybody who has, if he has joke writers. How, how does that sit with you, writing comedy during this period? So, I mean, I, to build on what Dave was saying, I mean, the extremism and absurdity that we live in every day limits the kind of jokes you can make. So, for example, here's the kind of joke that doesn't work anymore. They're separating families at the border. What, what are they going to do next? Put kids in cages? That'll make it easier for the guards to rape them. You know, and, and yesterday's black humor is today's immigration policy. Um, and he just, he invades our brains. You know, he, um, you can't flush a toilet twice without thinking about Trump these days. And, and um, you know, some days it strikes me there's nothing funny, but I think it's important to make jokes about him, um, not to trivialize what he's doing, but as an act of rebellion. Because Trump is a bully, but he's also a buffoon. And I do think to mock him sends the message, you have the title, but not the respect. Um, so, but to answer your specific question, um, I actually do think Trump has a sense of humor. I think it's mean and childish, but you know, people like the Three Stooges. Um, and once as an exercise, I did actually try to write jokes in his voice to see not would I write for him, but could I write for him. So I'm just going to do three quick jokes that I wrote for President Trump. Um, people got upset because I told Stormy Daniels that she was smart and reminded me of my daughter. In my defense, I couldn't say she was smart and reminded me of my sons. He could do that. It's mean. Um, here's another one. Uh, Mike Pence has a rule that he won't be alone with a woman unless his spouse is in the room. Melania has a rule that she won't be alone with her spouse unless a photographer's in the room. And, uh, oh, here's one I think he, he could have said at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Bill Clinton was eager to move back into the White House. You know why? It was the last place he had sex. So. <laughs> Thank you, Nell. Uh, Ashley, everyone is clamoring for your answer to this question. How can we be funny in tragic times? 
Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> when Trump was elected, I was on a Full Frontal with Sam B, which is a show that like takes all its jokes from the news. And I really got to the point, and I specifically remember the moment, it was during the Kavanaugh hearings, that I'm sitting at home and I'm watching this woman um, pour her guts out in front of the country to try to save us from a horrible fate. And I had the thought, oh, I'm gonna have to write jokes about this. And I was like, I gotta get out. <laughs> like, what a horrible way to live, to look at someone's pain and be like, well, gotta turn this into jokes for money. Um, so I left that show and now I'm on a sketch show. And what I, I started out in sketch, what I always loved, whoop, flying mic. Um, what I always love about sketch, especially as a woman of color, is people have, especially in Hollywood, these very narrow ideas about what Black women can do. And most of the time when women who look like me are on TV, they're crying about their son being in a gang. I don't have a son. My fake son is not in a gang. I just don't, like, <laughs> it's not my experience or the experience of anyone I know. And so what attracted me to sketch comedy initially was that I could play so many different kinds of characters. I could write for myself. I didn't have to have a son in a gang. And not only could I play a hundred different characters, I could play a hundred different characters in one show and force the audience to see that I'm a human being who has a lot of different ideas and experiences and is not just one thing. So the way that I'm doing comedy under Trump is that I stopped writing jokes about the news and went on to a show that just showcases my humanity. And I hope to at some point convince this country that I'm human. And if I don't, then at least the checks are nice and uh, I'll get a pool eventually. <laughs> we, all, we all root for that pool sooner, sooner than later. Um, I want to move on to our next segment, which is based on the original premise that, believe it or not, this this panel itself was pitched to Field Team Six, and the and the pitch was, if we put together a room full of 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 writers, could we, you know, come up with uh, a fix for the script that has been uh, America in 2020. And, and of course, we put together a, a fine panel of writers. It's not like a Hollywood panel of writers because they're half of, half of us are women and there's a person of color on it. But other than that, it's, uh, it's a distinguished group. And so I'm going to turn to each of you starting, oh, this time, let's say, with uh, Dave and ask uh, to be as, as extreme as you want and therefore as prescient as you can. How do you think the next two months are going to look? Um, boy, uh, how are the next two months going to look? I, I think it's going. I think we're going to basically be just clinging by our nails. Um, and I will say this to everyone who was good enough to show up for this: don't stop. Just do not stop, no matter what the polls say just do not stop because they are going to try everything they're going to try and stop voting they're going to try they're going to make stuff up they're going to say what they want to say it's going to get i think it's going to be two really 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 crazy months which by the way again nothing funny about any of this um if he was smart um Honestly, and you start to hear bits and pieces if he was really smart he would resign from the presidency make Pence the president and then run against the current administration. He seems to do a really good job with that and just sort of attack them for like just fucking up the country and messing it all up and run against that. Um, that's my phone ringing, sorry. Um, but honestly, I think it's going to be just two really, honestly, horrific months. I, again, uh, you're, you're, you're catching me just... Uh, uh, at a very down point where uh, I, I have nothing good to say. Uh, just keep, don't stop fighting. Um, that's all I can say. And do not ignore the down ballots because I think there's a, there's a tendency, um, and some people know this, uh, I, I was helping out with, uh, uh, I helped out with Julia's remarks for the Democratic uh, uh, Convention the other night. And if you watch that night, there's been a lot of reaching out to the other side to get Republicans to cross over. And I, and I do think that's important. And I do think it's important for Republicans that, des that you know, don't love him to come over. But let us not forget that Republicans are 
they've enabled him. They've enabled him to do this. And so we need to flip the Senate. We need to flip state legislatures to make sure that this stuff just does not happen again. And so that's all I can say is just don't take your foot off the gas um, because it's going to be, it's just going to be the craziest two months of our lives. That's what I honestly think is going to happen. So. Dave, just out of curiosity, what's your ringtone? Uh, it is um, uh, the Kill Bill, the da 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 da. Because I was dun, curious. Dun, 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 dun. Yep. Kill Team Six now knows who they have to pay royalties to. Um, Ashley, I want to go to you now. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Dave was saying. And um, last election, you know, my brothers are young men. They're very cool. They're musicians. One of them's a drummer. So, you know, the personality. And my mom put a padlock on the door and was like, you can have a key back in when you show your I voted sticker. So like, please spare no expense, whatever you have to do to get everyone you know to vote, go out and buy a padlock. Don't let your teens back in the house uh, before they do it. Um, what do I think is gonna happen? I've actually really thought a lot about it. And I think um, Kamala Harris is just like a force we've never seen before in this country. And she just is going to push people's buttons in um, a very crazy way. I think we're gonna see a lot of racism and misogyny getting thrown at her and we're gonna have to be willing to stand up and not hide in secret Facebook groups like we did last time and I'm guilty of it too. But I think what's gonna happen is she's gonna go on TV, she's gonna say something really smart and Donald Trump is gonna get so mad that his blood pressure goes up so high that he has a heart attack and he dies on camera on Fox News. And the people on Fox are gonna be like very smart Mr. Trump and the Republicans are gonna be like, oh no, what are we gonna do? We don't have a president anymore. We don't have a plan. We didn't even make a platform. But it's the Ivanka and Jared are gonna be like, don't worry about it, it's okay, we have a plan. And they're gonna weekend at Bernie him. And they're just gonna wheel him out and they're gonna like prop him up behind a podium and people will chant, lock her up and cheer and scream and just be like, so happy to see him. It's not gonna, they're not gonna notice that like his skin is falling off. And then Democrats will be like, he's dead. They're like, but he's dead, Donald Trump is dead. And the people on Fox will be like, oh, just because the president's arm fell off on TV, Democrats are saying he's dead. And we'll get to election day and a lot of people will vote for his corpse. Uh, and uh, hopefully a few less than vote for Joe Biden. It, it, it's our only hope is that the mortician does a better job than than he does with the makeup, and which therefore will make it clear that he is he is in fact dead. Uh, I want to go now to Nell. So I think the next couple of months are going to be a really weird combination of more deaths uh, from COVID and more bragging from the president, and I predict. Trump will eventually boast, I could kill 200,000 people on Fifth Avenue and not lose a single vote. So, um, you know, like, like everyone else, I think the next two months are gonna be really rough and it could get uglier than Kim Guilfoyle when she takes her makeup off. <laughs> that <one>. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll move on to Al with, with that in mind, with that image in mind, Al? Well, David was bragging. I just wanted to say I wrote the remarks for Kim Real Guilfoyle, and uh, I haven't heard back from anyone, but I assume they went over just great. Uh, secondly, I, I just wanted to say Trump has done something that is really amazing, which I would never have thought of. If you've committed a crime and you're caught, commit more crimes, cover up your crimes. It's just this amazing strategy. And um, to me, the next two months, they're really the one thing to do, and I want to thank everybody who paid to come to this thing tonight, is to vote and encourage voting. And I really appreciate it. If you came tonight, thank you. I'll deliver pizza to you, contactless. I just want to say I really appreciate it, and uh, I think this is all you can do. So uh, I've been reminded that by the, by the finger in my ear that part of my job is to uh, remind people that this is a fundraiser and that we are still at the $22,140 mark and that uh, we're, we're, we're a bit short in terms of making it to our, uh, uh, our total. So uh, in, in an effort to goose things along, here's my pitch for what I think is gonna happen in the next two months. 
Picture this, the crew of a Russian submarine contracts instant COVID. It's a new form of COVID, crashes, they all die and crash into the coast of Maryland. The, 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 the device on board is detonated, destroys the Naval Academy at Annapolis. This actually embarrasses Putin. That's the twist we don't expect. Putin is embarrassed enough to call Trump. And in a moment of humility, he offers Trump the COVID vaccine that he's been keeping secret. Trump then offers that vaccine to any American in exchange for uh, a vote for him. That alone, I think, is worth the 20, uh, 2300 and uh, $2,860 that, uh, that we're short. Um, I'm, I'm looking, I'm seeing Al and recognizing that stone face from every other executive I've ever pitched to. So uh, thank I'm you for I'm working in a Zoom that. room for 25 straight weeks, pal. <laughs> <laughs> it's very <pretty Yeah>. hard. <laughs> All right. Al and I only go back 40 years. Perhaps if I'd known him longer, he might have laughed at that. Um, so, uh, as I said earlier, moving on, as I said earlier, the phrase jump the shark refers to an episode of Happy Days that aired on the ABC television network, uh, September 20th, 1977. It was the number one show of the week. We have with us today the writer of that episode, at least I hope we have him with us today. Can our, can our technical people assure me that Fred Fox Jr. is here? There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, the writer of, of that episode of Happy Days and 29 other episodes of Happy Days, along with a dozen other series over a storied 30-year career, Fred Fox Jr. F Fred, where you are? Where I, I see me again. Where There you are. Fred, welcome. Uh, Fred, you're, you're muted. Is that better? Can we, can That's better. Me? Excellent. Well, first of all, I'd like to say you guys are an incredible panel. Uh, I've admired your work. Um, it's just great. I'm honored to be a part of this. Um, so um, it's hard to talk about Jump the Shark after what we just talked about, these frightening scenarios with our the T word president. It's a little scary. So but, but Fred, tell us, do tell us something about, about the episode itself and about, for example, the reaction to the show at the time. Um, for those, this could be redundant for those that don't know, but um, for those that uh, don't know, um, it was, we wanted to do a three-part episode um, for the fall of op opener in um, 1977. Uh, we came up with an A story, um, a talent agency, talent agent's car breaks down, walks into Arnold's, sees Fonzie's magic with the ladies. He said, oh my God, there's another James Dean. So Fonzie and the Cunningham group go to Hollywood. Uh, so that's the A story. Uh, the B story is on the beach, Fonzie meets this cocky surfer guy named the California Kid, played by James Dotton. And it kind of comes to a head. We have a water skiing race. Amazingly, it's a tie. So we need a tiebreaker. So um, it's, it's interesting. I, I can see a Happy Days episode, you know, the first season. I started on the fourth season, and I can remember who did a joke. But I, no one can really remember who came up with the idea for the Jump the Shark. So um, anyway, so we, Monday morning, we read the script. And that time, no one said, are you guys out of your mind? Finally, Jump a Shark. But um, Henry in real life water skied as a kid, so I think he was just excited that he could water ski. So um, it aired, and as you said, it was you know number one, you know fifty something share. You know we were all excited. Um, and then in I think eighty seven, um, there were three three or four students at the University of Michigan, a gentleman named John High, and they're watching Nick at night having some beers. Um, one of them said, Hey, what? What was when your favorite TV show started going downhill? What what was that for you? One person says, "Well, um, when so and so went on the love boat." Someone said, "Well, no, on the Flintstones." And then one of them said, "Oh, no, no, no! It was Fonzie jumps the shark." Apparently, there's like silence in the room, and John started the um, jump the shark website, and then wrote a book where um, where everything 
you know, started going down, whether it was acting, sports figures. Um, so when I, when I first saw this happening, I thought, oh my God, I wrote that episode, should I, should I wear a scarlet letter F and walk around? And then <laughs> over time, it, it was interesting when people found out I wrote that episode, um, women would, would ask me for a slow dance. It was, it was amazing. So um, I started to think, well, gosh, this is um, different. I was going to pit, I uh, had an, a meeting to pitch an episode of the executive at Disney and uh, the young lady was looking over my resume and she saw I worked on Happy Days and she said, oh, by, by any chance, do you know who um, wrote that episode? And I said, I did. And she was so excited. We talked about that and I never pitched anything. Um, but also, um, Alan and David, I'd like to thank you for your support about it wasn't the end of Happy Days. We went six more years. We're in the you know, top 25. Um, I actually was able to work after that. Um, so I, I was very lucky. I had a, a, nice, a nice run. So it was um, very exciting. Thanks, Fred. I, um, I, I, I appreciate the point that Happy Days went on for another six seasons. I looked it up. It was episode 91 of a 255 episode series, which tells us that jumping the shark may not actually mean the end of something. And so I want to uh, turn to the panelists and, and try to try to land this plane, as it were, on a, on a, on a more positive note. Uh, and, and let's, let's, try to, let, let's try to see if there's a happy ending for the three and a half years of what seemed like an epic biblical disaster. Um, Ashley, do you, wanna, do you wanna try? Oh boy, this is so against my nature. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, uh, the NBA choosing not to play games last night actually really filled me with hope. And I didn't know that there was still a part of my body that manufactured that chemical. Um, so I do think that as much as things are very scary and very hard right now, more people than ever are... Um, awake to what's going on. And I think we're gonna see probably a lot of first time voters this year that aren't just 18 year olds, that are people who, you know, had the opportunity to vote in the past and maybe thought it really didn't matter or thought that the government doesn't directly affect their lives. And what better than a pandemic to show us all that what's happening in government has a direct effect on what happens in our lives and to our bodies. And so my hope for this not being the end, but being in episode 91, <laughs> is that um, we use all of that energy and that anxiety and all of those things that we feel to band together and do some good things and that we see a lot of first time voters this year and that it goes our way. Thank you, Ashley. Nell, how about you? Um, um, Here's how I would like it to end. I want it to end like a nighttime soap opera, like Dynasty. And the final scene starts with Donald and Jared arguing in Trump Tower. And they're each blaming the other for Trump's loss. And um, it's getting heated and Jared decides to take off because, you know, he's younger and skinnier and he runs out, but Donald pursues and they chase each other, although when they get to the escalator, I think they should just both stand on the escalator and then pick up the race when they get to the bottom. Jared runs out into the street and that's when Donald pulls out a gun. Because just like he bragged, he's gonna shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it's gonna be Jared. Yeah. So now Donald squeezes the trigger and just then Ivanka runs out of the crowd shouting, no, and she throws herself in front of the bullet intended for Jared. So now her father watches in horror as Ivanka takes the hit and she crumples to the ground. She's dead, but she still looks perfectly put together. And Donald falls on his knees and this is where he cries in despair, dear God, 
What cruel twist of fate allowed me to kill the one thing I kind of sort of love? End scene. Or, or the meteor. I like the meteor ending too. The meteor is good. I hope that's not what, what uh, Al had in mind because Al's next. Well, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to be on with Fred. And what he said gave me a lot of hope because he's saying America has six more seasons. So <laughs> it's really great. And uh, uh, I, I actually wanted to turn away from Trump just for a second to find a hopeful thing in a very, very terrible thing, which is the coronavirus. And, you know, uh, it's a terrible thing. But, you know, you, you see things that have changed because of it. And, you know, carbon dioxide release is way down. And, um, People are learning other ways than burning fossil fuels to do things. And in my opinion, it's like a, a warm up game for global warming. And uh, I think that, you know, if you look at the, the way things are going this year, you, you may see people being much more aware of the future of the planet and um, what we have to do and taking, you know, warnings from scientists more seriously than they have in years in the past. So I have a little reason for hope from that. Thank you, Al. Dave, with the final word. Um, Fred, I got to say, I think you also got a bum rap. I would have gone with the Dude Ranch episodes, those two parters in a second. And then certainly maybe then Ted McGinley, who I think of as much more of when Richie leaves, there's no show. I know people think it's Fonzie, but Fonzie's a co-star, not a star. And so Richie's your heart, Richie's your center. And when Richie leaves, that's the problem. And I feel like when we elect Joe Biden, we get Richie back. That's kind of where I'm going with this whole thing. Um, I have a lot of hope in that my son has gotten really good at Fortnite. So if those are skills in the future that will help us, I think that's going to be really good because our parenting has gone out the fucking window and he plays 24 hours a day. So if there's a way that that transcends into a 21st century skill, I think we're going to be really good there. Um, I bought an above ground pool that I paid almost $3,000 for on eBay, even though it retails for $400. So I think that speaks well to the sort of go get them consumer nature of this country. So there's, there's some positivity there. Um, I, look, I, I do think, um, you know, and uh, this is again, this, these horrible things to say, uh, sort of, uh, I'm sort of uh, piggybacking on, um, you know, the COVID virus, I think people paying attention to some of this, these shootings, these are good things. I hate that they have to happen sort of 200,000 times or 80 times for people to go, wait a second, police are militarized. Police are shooting people for no reason. It sort of uh, just seems a little like, how many times does it have to happen? But I guess I do have hope that with a, you know, an actual democratic Senate with, two hou with both houses and the White House, things like maybe the John Lewis uh, Voter Rights Act might get passed, you know, that these things might get passed. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess I, I leave it there, but I do feel very strongly about the Dude Ranch episode. And I just want to come back to that point. So. Did you write that one too? Did I just fuck you again? Did, I'm sorry, Fred. Well, I think, um, I hate to say this, I may have written one of the part, but I wrote the better part, I think. <laughs> okay. um, this is my, check, but I, you're forgiven though because you guys have been great. Thank you. Th th this is why writers should never talk about other writers' work if they don't know who actually wrote it. But so, very important. Thank you. I just let the record show, um, and I think Al's sort of with me on this. I, Happy Days is just rules, and it is one of the founding elements of my television education, and I have no problem saying that. So, yes, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just messing around. Uh, I can't make fun of the Dude Ranch episode if I don't know the Dude Ranch episode backwards and forwards. So I just want to be clear <laughs> about that. No, believe me, everything I've written is not, uh, not great. So uh, it's very good. Let, let, me, uh, let me put a pin in our part of the discussion by pointing out that we are still $950 shy of our goal. And in order to achieve that goal, I'm going to issue this challenge. If anyone can watch the following clip without breaking into tears, you have to be the person who pays that for that, um, for, for that final amount. <laughs>
<laughs> there you have it. Uh, and since I did not break out into tears, I guess it means that, that I will pledge the remainder of the money. But, uh, and, and I apologize most wholeheartedly, even as a former president of the Writers Guild. <laughs> Wait a minute, it's still continuing. I'm sorry, I need to. I need... You're rubbing it in my face. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that was that 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 was not intentional. Uh, the the uh, my my point was just that I uh, uh, I I will uh, I will front the rest of the money to get us to to twenty five thousand and uh, uh, in lieu of actually paying you the residual for or the clip fee for the reuse of that of that. Well, I, you know, I, I think I I should pay some of that because um, I feel so guilty for writing that episode. Well, you're, I think, I think Guilty and Six will take both of our money. Uh, now I'm going to turn it back to, uh, to, uh, to Jason Berlin to give us our, our epilogue. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that. that uh, you're amazing. Um, I was laughing my ass off in silence. Um, but yes, so, so to all of you um, on the panel, um, th thank you for being badass enough to dare to write comedy in this insane time. I feel like, you know, you emerge from the, the, the black cloud of smoke smiling. That's insane, you're heroes, and, uh, and laughter is one of the most precious, rare things right now keeping us alive. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanna say thank you to all the WGA writers on our volunteer staff, who right now are, are using their powers to uh, write our phone bank and text bank scripts, reaching out to voters, and also helping to put together the newsletter. Couldn't do that without you. Um, and I wanna say that we are, you know, uh, we're the ones who get to write the ending to this story. We are the demos in democracy, you know, and we're, we're, we're trying to get more demos all the time in this democracy, trying to register uh, as many people as we can. This deep ugly is being answered by a deeper beauty and uh, Ashley, like you were talking about, this uh, is the biggest political reawakening we've seen in uh, ever, as far as I know. Um, people are are rising up and and waking up and standing up. So, uh, you know, remember that we took back the House in 2018. In 2019, we put a Democrat in the Kentucky governor's mansion. And we turned Virginia, former capital of the Confederacy, Union Blue. It's ours now. And we're on the march. So we're going to do this. Um, join us. Get loud. Stay loud. Join us at fieldteam6.org. You can find phone banks and text banks or donate so we can reach more voters. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We got 68 days left to keep fighting. And we are going to take back our democracy. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Oh, yes. Thank you everyone for attending the event over. If you have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat.
guys, um, it's unmuted. You guys can unmute yourselves if you guys want to have a question. Um, Amanda, I don't have an answer for you yet. I'd have to talk with our digital people. They'll they'll have a better answer for you, but I'll write it down to make sure um, we can ask answer your question. I I yeah. So I, I don't have anything hard for you. So but send us an email, and I will definitely see if we can get you an answer by Monday. We hope you guys enjoyed the show. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. I'm just leaving the room open because the spin room is going on. <laughs> okay, how do I see that? Amanda, do you know how to save the chat in the file? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. I got it. Okay. Let's do Zoom.